Charles Starkweather, a 19-year-old boy, was desperate. Wanting to marry his girlfriend, needed some money, so he wouldn't be broke every day. Needs to get out of Nebraska, where everyone thinks, he is a loser. In the end, he and his girlfriend, Carol, went on a murder spree, that had the entire country, horrified. Indeed, the nation was going through unsettling cultural changes. A new generation of rebels, challenged the sterile 1950s with frightening and offensive symbols of rebellion, James Dean, and the whole rock and roll, era. The country, that uncomfortably watched James Dean's rebel, without a cause, saw Charles Starkweather, as a Dean-like figure, to make them even more, uncomfortable. The son of a hard-working family, Charlie Starkweather was born in Lincoln, Nebraska, in 1938. In the Depression years, during which he and his siblings were born, they never went hungry. Though Charlie's family was poor, it did not prevent him from having a decent childhood, and good memories. Local people remembered the Starkweathers, as polite, and well-behaved. Charlie's early childhood memories are enjoyable, but his school experiences are traumatic. In the classroom, he lost the comfort he felt at home. His petty speech impediment, and his bow legs, were teased by the children. On top of that, Charlie had average intelligence, never worked hard, and was a slow learner. And then, his myopia, which went undetected until he was 15, contributed to his problems. In fact, Jim was the only thing he was good at. He was strong, and well coordinated. It was his only source of self-esteem. But he used the same muscles, to fight with the other boys who bullied him. And he earned a reputation for being one of the meanest, toughest kids in Lincoln. In the ninth grade, he met Bob Bush, and after a fight, he became one of his closest friends. Bob said, he was the kindest person you've ever known. To him, everything was just a big joke. But, he also had a cruel side, he could be mean as hell. James Dean was a fan of both boys. Charlie tried to mimic Dean's mannerisms, hairstyle, tight jeans and cowboy boots. But Charlie was no James Dean in looks, brains or talent. He was an inferior copy. For Starkweather, poverty was a trap. He could map its confines and trace its borders, but Charles could see no escape for himself. He saw he would not be able to flee the bludgeoning poverty, which had characterized his working-class childhood. But instead, would be condemned to repeat it. Eventually finding himself a manual job, a wife, having children, and then simply dying. During the tough times, Charlie's close buddy, Bob Bush, began to date Barbara Fugati, in 1956. Charlie eventually became interested in Barbara's younger sister, Carol, who had just turned 13. So, the four of them double dated, despite Carol's age. Carol was a pretty girl, with dark brown hair, and a bright smile. She, too, had a broad streak of rebellion in her, and a mercurial temper. Academically, she wasn't very good, and had failed a grade in elementary school. Despite her teachers saying she was a slow learner, Charlie believed she was a wizard. He treated her like a goddess. And, probably because she was so young, she thought he was really cool, and had no appreciation for his serious weaknesses. She was impressed by his cars, toughness, and, despite his poverty. The way he could give her, almost anything she wanted. Carol meant more to him, than anything had before. And without her, he would be thrust back, into a world, he hated so much. Carol almost even made him, stop hating himself. He saw himself as reflected in her eyes, and he looked pretty good. At the same time, he quit school at 16, and went loading and unloading trucks at the Western Newspaper Union. Charlie's boss didn't think much of him, but of all the guys in the warehouse, he was the worst. In fact, Charlie didn't like his boss or the job either. He only bit a tongue, because the warehouse, was near the school Carol attended. So, he was able to see his only hope in life, every day. He taught her how to drive despite being too young to drive. 
And one day, Carol took Charlie's car, and crashed it. In response, Charlie's father, who had to pay for the damages to the other car, kicked him out of the house, after a big fight. Charlie then moved to his friend's house, Bob, and his wife, Barbara Fugati. Now that his relationship with his parents was strained, Carol became the center of Charlie's life. So he began spreading the news, that he, and Carol, were getting married. Then he started telling his friends, that Carol was pregnant with his child. A lie, that turned out bad, when Carol's parents heard it. Unlucky for him, Charlie quit his paper company job, and started to work as a trash collector in the town. It was hardly a career enhancement, but it allowed him to be off work when she was done with her studies. The pay was only $42 a week, not even enough to support himself. On top of that, his landlady was unsympathetic, and locked him out, because he hadn't paid his rent. At the time, Charlie began to see himself as trapped in a life of poverty. With his limited intellect, all he could think of, was to do something really dramatic, like rob a bank. Every day on his route, collecting the garbage from across town, where the middle, and upper classes of Lincoln lived, he saw what he was being excluded from. While heaving heavy, stinking sacks of trash, for a minimum wage, Starkweather realized, there was only one way for him to find equality, one way, in which he would find himself, on an equal footing with the rest of society, which had oppressed, dominated, and alienated him. A method by which he would find retribution, dead people, are all on the same level. Charlie gradually convinced himself, he had to live a life of crime, to get the money, and respect he desired. Just the day before, he wanted to buy a toy dog for Carol, at the gas station. But, he didn't have enough money. And he couldn't buy the toy on credit. So, he decided, he would get back, at those, who turned their noses up at him. And that was to be, on the first day of December, 1957. It was below zero, and the raw Nebraska winds, were whipping mercilessly. Almost 3 a.m. And it was time to get started. He drove to the gas station, that had refused him credit, armed with a shotgun he had stolen from Bob Bush. At the moment, 21-year-old, Robert Colvert, who humiliated Charlie the day before, was on duty alone at the station. A short, slender man with a young wife, and a baby on the way. While Colvert worked on the carburetor, Charlie came by, and bought a pack of camels, then left. A few minutes later, he returned to the station. This time, Charlie bought a pack of gum, and again drove off. Then, in his disguise, he tied a bandana over his face, and wore a hat, to cover his red hair. Charlie walked back into the station, with the shotgun, and canvas bag for looting. Until Colvert felt the shotgun stab his back, he was working on a car, and had no idea anyone was there. Charlie then made him open the cash drawer, and put all the money in the canvas bag. After that, he decided to take Colvert for a ride. A terrified station employee, drove them to Bloody Mary's house. It was a crazy old woman who fired a shotgun full of rock salt, at anybody who trespassed on her property. And this is where Charlie ordered Colvert out of the car. While fighting for his life, Colvert attempted to take the gun from Starkweather, but he shot him once, knocking him down. Charlie then shot him twice in the head, as he knelt on the ground. Since there was so little serious crime in that area, newspapers made the murder, and robbery, a major news event. While cops struggled to find their guy, Starkweather painted his car, and some other dumb things, that drew attention to him. But in the end, authorities believed a transient committed the hold and murder, so the pressure was off Charlie for the time being. This too, along with the murder, gave Starkweather, euphoria, and peace. He had money, a girl, and killing, without feeling bothered by it. It gave him an enormous feeling of power. As he now, operated outside the laws of man. He felt unreachable. As if he could do whatever he pleased. The law was helpless against him. The day after he robbed, and murdered, Robert Colvert, 
Charlie confessed to Carol, he held up the gas station, but someone else shot Colvert. She was not fooled, but, by the time, they became bound by the killing. He seemed to understand, this was the last time, they would ever have together. Until their time ran out, he could give Carol whatever he liked, so they could have that life, for a little while. It didn't matter their time together was short. What mattered, was that they had it all together. Once the euphoria wore off, Charlie was faced with some grim realities. He had been fired from his job, as a garbage man. His landlady had locked him out in the freezing cold because he was past due on his rent, and both his and Carol's families, were against their relationship, and sought to break it up. Carol put on some weight, and her family thought she was pregnant. His poor father was so worried, and desperate. While her father trying to digest this information, Starkweather drove to the squalid dump, where Carol, and her family lived. There was litter, and unused construction materials everywhere. Charlie knocked on the back door with his gun. Carol's mother, Velda Bartlett, walked in. It is impossible to confirm what happened afterwards. Based on Starkweather's memories. After the fact, he was carrying the rifle, and ammunition to hunt with Carol's stepfather, Marion Bartlett, in the hopes, of fixing their relationship. He also brought two discarded carpet samples, for Velda. Marion and Velda, were both there, also their two-year-old kid, Betty Jean, was crying. Velda told Charlie, they didn't want him to see Carol again. After that, there was a loud argument, and Velda allegedly hit Charlie in the face. So, he left and drove around for a while, without the rifle, and then came back to retrieve it. Apparently, Velda took his gun. Anyway, when he came back again, Marion literally kicked him out the door. Starkweather left again, but this time when he went back, to Carol's house, he waited outside for Carol to come home. Eventually, he told Carol what happened with her mother, and stepfather, and then she went into the house, and argued with her mother. But, Starkweather followed her inside. Velda began hitting him again, screaming that he had made Carol pregnant. The two wrestled for a few minutes, before Charlie got the gun. At the time, Bartlett, entered the room, allegedly holding a claw hammer, so, Starkweather shot him twice in the head. Velda then allegedly stabbed Charlie, with a huge knife. However, unfortunately for the woman, she was shot twice in the face. As if that wasn't enough, he also rammed the barrel of the rifle, into her head. And when she tried to get up, to go get her baby, he hit the baby with the rifle's butt. After the alleged murders, Velda was dragged to the old outhouse, and shoved down the toilet opening. Likewise, Carol's half-sister, was put in a garbage box, and was taken to the outhouse. And in the chicken coop, Marion Bartlett was dumped. After that, Carol and Charlie cleaned up the blood, and the mess inside, then spent the rest of the evening, drinking Pepsi, and eating chips. They stayed in the house, just a few yards, from the rotting corpses, of Carol's family. Several people visited the house, after the murders. But, a sign on the front door said, stay away. Everyone is sick with flu. Carol's sister, Barbara Bush, and her husband came to visit, but Carol discouraged them both with the flu story. In the end, Bob returned with his brother, to investigate their suspicions. And now, the story had changed. Carol was in tears, as she told them. Please don't try to get in. Mom's life depends on you. In the end, the Bush brothers, called the police. Later, police arrived, and Carol told them, again the family was sick. And simply, they left, as Carol seemed trustworthy, and not in danger. Carol's grandmother, Pansy, went to her daughter's house. Carol knew that her grandmother wouldn't be fooled by her flu story, so she embroidered another one of her stories. Pansy became angry, Carol wouldn't let Pansy in, so she went to the police, and finally persuaded them to look inside the house, despite not having a warrant. When they came this time, the house was empty, and it appeared there was no violence, or disorder inside the house.
Bob demanded later that day that the police scour the property, but they refused. So, Bob, and his brother, searched the Bartlett house on behalf of the police, and inside the outhouse, and chicken coop, they saw what they feared. In response, police paid them some attention, and they went out to pick up Charlie Starkweather, and Carol Fugati. However, what police failed to realize, at the time, is that, this was only the beginning, of this drama. When Starkweather, and Carol realized they had better skip town, they also understood, that Charlie's car wouldn't take them very far. First of all, the tires were flat. So, Charlie tried to fix the worst one before leaving, but the repair didn't last, and they soon were looking for a garage. A family friend of Charlie's, August Meyer, became a temporary refuge. By all accounts, Meyer was a kind, and had known Charlie since he was a boy. Charlie would hunt on Meyer's farm about 20 miles outside Lincoln. After pulling onto Meyer's dirt track, they immediately became mired in the mud. It is hard to say why Charlie shot Meyer in the head, since Carol, and Charlie's stories, were contradictory. Charlie claimed in this case, too, that he acted in self-defense. Meyer shot Charlie, but the gun jammed, so Charlie retaliated. Charlie then wounded Meyer's dog. Charlie hid the body, of his old friend under a blanket in an outbuilding. They broke into Meyer's home, stole his money, and guns, ate his food, and fell asleep. And the next day, a neighbor helped them free their car from the mud, and they drove to Meyer's farm. When Charlie checked on the body of his friend, he was spooked, by the fact that the blanket, was suddenly gone. As Charlie and Carol feared discovery, they drove down the path. Unsurprisingly, the couple got stuck again. Taking only their weapons, they left the old Ford where it was. Hiding their shotguns, the two of them hitched a ride, from 17-year-old Robert Jensen, and Carol King, 16. And within moments, the gun was at Jensen's neck, and Charlie wanted money. Jensen had to drive back to Meyer's farm, to an abandoned storm cellar. That's where he put six bullets into Jensen's head. Then he shot Carol King, once in the face. She was half naked, with her jeans and pants, down around her ankles. She'd been stabbed repeatedly, in the abdomen, but there was no semen in her vagina. While all this was going on, Carol was allegedly sitting in the car. Charlie attributed the mutilation of King's body to Carol, who he claimed was angry with the dead girl, for being attractive to Starkweather. Charlie, and Carol, took off with Jensen's car, while the bodies were left in the storm cellar. Despite talking about escaping to Washington, to stay with Charlie's brother, they did something dumb. They drove back to Lincoln, where everyone knew them, also looked for them. Stupidly, they drove past the Bartlett house, to see if the bodies of Carol's parents had been found. When they saw all the cop cars around the property, they got their answer. They eventually, drove to the most affluent part of town, and crashed in their stolen car. The next day, Starkweather's car was found in the Meyer farm mud. The bodies of Meyer, and the teenagers were found shortly after. And by now, there was a massive manhunt underway, however, more killings, were still to come. Charlie, who collected garbage, knew the best part of town well. It was the home of Lauer Ward, 47. A close friend of the governor, and president of Capitol Steel, and Capitol Bridge. Clara Ward, a socially prominent wife of an industrialist, and Lillian Fenkel, a 51-year-old, hard-of-hearing maid, were home, along with their Chesapeake Bay Retriever, Queenie, and their tiny poodle, Susie. Lillian Fenkel answered the door, and Charlie pointed a gun at her. Carol stayed in the car. She was ordered to lock up Queenie in the basement. Because the maid had a hearing problem, he wrote her notes to make himself understood. He told her to keep making breakfast for Mr. Ward. And when Clara Ward, came into the kitchen, Charlie assured her all would be well. So, Clara stayed calm, and agreed to help. Charlie had Carol go into the house, 
where Mrs. Ward, had prepared coffee for her. Carol then went to the library, and fell asleep. Clara Ward asked permission around to change her shoes upstairs. After a few minutes, Charlie went upstairs to see what was keeping her. She ah and shot at him, but missed. He threw a knife at her, and hit her in the back, and stabbed her repeatedly, in the chest, and neck. After dragging Clara's body into the bedroom, Susie started barking at him, so he broke her neck with the gun. Starkweather called his dad after killing Clara, and told him to tell Bob Bush, that he would kill him, for interfering with Charlie's relationship, with Carol. Later, they loaded Ward's Packard with food, and fled. They ransacked the house, and stole everything. Law Ward came home from work, almost an hour later, to face Starkweather's gun. Charlie fought the industrialist for a long time, before shooting him dead. He then turned on Lillian Fenkel. Charlie, and Carol, tied her up, and stabbed her to death. Ward's cousin, and a business associate, called the house all morning, because they missed him at work. He went over to the house around noon, and let himself in. Upon entry, he found Ward, his wife, and their maid dead. As Queenie barked furiously downstairs, Susie cowered under the bed, with a broken neck. Anderson was notified of the savage attack on his friend. Immediately following, he called in the National Guard, who began cruising the street, in jeeps armed with mounted machine guns. Parents with guns drawn rushed to the schools, and took their children home. A block-by-block -block search began. The FBI, started an investigation. A thousand dollar reward, was offered by the mayor. And aircraft, sent up to help look for the Black Packard. How did these clever outlaws get away? Right back to Carol's parents' house. They really did. But wisely, they didn't go inside, because a car was in the driveway, and the house was lighted up. They finally realized, they couldn't go back to the Bartlett house. Then, decided to head west, towards Washington. After driving all night, they crossed into Wyoming the following day. Both times they were reported, as acting suspicious, but nothing came of it. During the trip, they looked for a car to stay at, Elland came across Merle Collison, a traveling Montana salesman, sleeping in his Buick, parked along the highway. Charlie called the salesman, and announced they were trading cards, but he apparently didn't agree quickly enough, so he shot him several times in the head, neck, arm, and leg. Starkweather then tried to start the car, with Collison dead, in the front seat, and Carol in the back, but he couldn't release the emergency brake. So, a young geologist stopped to help the couple, thinking they had a car trouble. And once he stopped, Charlie pointed the gun at the man, and told him to help release the emergency brake, or he will shoot him. The geologist, saw the dead man slumped, in the passenger's seat, and realized he'd have to get the gun away from Starkweather, if he wanted to live. As they struggled, William Romer, the Wyoming deputy sheriff, stopped, and helped. Carol jumped out, and ran to Roma as soon as he got out of the car. She cried, and said, take me to the police. As Charlie witnessed the scene, he got into the Packard, and drove back to Douglas. Roma set up a roadblock, and started chasing him. They chased after the Packard, on the way to Douglas. Where, Starkweather suddenly came to a halt, in the middle of the highway. Two police officers, cautiously pulled up behind the Packard, and waited for Starkweather to exit. No matter how yellow he was, he shot well, in a Hollywood style. The first American teenage spree killer, caught on camera, bloodied, in chains, shaggy-haired, with a cigarette dangling from his lips, wearing a black leather motorcycle jacket, tight black denim pants, and white cowboy boots. Amid all the drama, Carol maintained she was a hostage throughout the whole scenario. And kept going with Charlie, because she feared that he would kill her family, if she didn't. The only problem with that story, was that she admitted seeing all the Nebraska murders, included her parents, and half-sister. Charlie, and Carol, were charged with first-degree murder, and murder while committing a robbery. 
and since both were being tried as adults, both faced the possibility of the electric chair. The trial began on May, 1958. Charlie did nothing to improve his prospects. Despite his lawyer's desperate attempts to build an insanity defense, he maintained his sanity. In fact, to Charlie, and his family, the stigma of being insane, was worse than the stigma, of being a cold-blooded killer. On the other hand, the prosecutor had an easy task, proving Charlie was sane, when he robbed, and killed Jensen. Charlie initially told the authorities that Carol had nothing to do with the crimes. As he was being taken to the jail in Douglas, Wyoming, he said, don't be rough on her. She didn't have anything to do with it. But, as he realized, Carol was posing as an unwilling hostage, instead of his girlfriend, he implicated her in the crimes. She may be responsible for several murders, and all of the mutilations. Carol Fugarty should get the same punishment as this lad, and I can tell you right now, she is never going to get the death penalty. Within 24 hours, the jury ruled, guilty on both counts of first-degree murder. The defense at Carol's trial, centered on her being a hostage, forced by Starkweather, to go on his murder spree. She, like Charlie, was found guilty of murder in 1958. Since she was 14 years old, she received a life sentence rather than the electric chair. And in 1976, she was released from the Nebraska Center for Women, after serving her sentence. Thanks for watching.